So thank you all for joining us um, for this special screening and conversation following the levees in Monticello um, with our director, Steve Pressman, Professor Mark Dollinger, and Professor Marjolyn Armstrong. I'm Rebecca Pierce. I'm the marketing and communications manager at the Jewish Film Institute. Uh, I also work as a writer and a journalist focusing on issues of race, anti-Semitism, and black Jewish solidarity in the US. At JFI, we seek to support films and filmmakers that expand and evolve the Jewish story, and we believe that the Levies of Monticello plays an important role in doing both. Um, this is a story, the story of the Levy family and their work to maintain Thomas Jefferson's historic residence at Monticello sits at the intersection of anti-Semitism, racism, white nationalism, and historic memory in the United States. These topics could not be more um, timely in our present moment where we're seeing rising white nationalist violence, efforts to silence conversations around race in the US, and there's also a somewhat of a cultural obsession about the um, relationships and um, sometimes tension between the black and Jewish community in the US that often tends to produce more heat than light. Um, in order to unpack these issues, we have an excellent panel here today, and I'm gonna just introduce quickly all of our panelists. You know, you've heard from uh, Stephen Pressman, who was our director today. He was born and raised in Los Angeles. He received an undergraduate degree in political science at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, he worked as a newspaper and magazine journalist for many years. Um, as a filmmaker, Stephen directed and produced 50 Children, The Rescue Mission of Mr. and Mrs. Krauss, which premiered on HBO, and received an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Historical Programming. His next film, Holy Silence, uh, had its broadcast premiere on PBS in 2020 and has been seen at numerous festivals around the world and other venues in the US. Um, Stephen, as you've heard, was also a filmmaker in residence at the Jewish Film Institute uh, while he was working on Holy Silence. Um, Dr. Mark Dollinger holds the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies and Social Responsibility at San Francisco State University. He has served as a research fellow at Princeton University Center for the Study of Religion, as well as the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow and Lecturer um, in the Humanities at Bryn Mawr College, where he coordinated the, pro the program in Jewish Studies. Professor Dollinger is the author of four scholarly new books in American Jewish history, most recently Black Power, Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance of the 1960s. Um, Marjolyn Armstrong is an associate professor at, the, at uh, Santa Clara University Law School. She's published articles and book chapters in the areas of racial discrimination, fair housing, privilege studies, comparative law, and constitutional law. This includes the original and updated versions of Privilege Revealed, one of the first academic explorations of racial privilege as applied to the law. Prior to joining the law faculty at Santa Clara, Professor Armstrong practiced public employment law and served as a staff attorney with legal aid of Alameda County. She's a graduate of the University of California Berkeley Law School, and she serves on the board of directors of NARAL, Pro Choice America Foundation. If you're noticing a resemblance between us, she's also my mom. <laughs> Very proud mom. <laughs> so with that, we're gonna jump right into discussing this film, and there's a lot to discuss and a lot of different ideas that we're gonna hear today, so I'm just gonna uh, dive right in. Um, Steven, your previous documentaries focused primarily on the Holocaust. Why did you feel that it was important to tell this story, and why now? I suppose the somewhat snarky answer is that after spending many years immersed in the world of the Holocaust with my first two films, I, I really wanted to move away from that very dark world. Uh, there are still wonderful stories to be told, important stories to be told. Um, but the other reason why I, I chose this subject is that even with my first two films that were re that revolved around the Holocaust, I, I always had an interest in finding sort of American themes and elements that, that figured into whatever story I was telling. Uh, and, uh, and so a few years back when I was thinking about what the next project would be, um, in addition to wanting to move away from the Holocaust, um, I had just one of those sort of the share it moments, a, a term that some folks in the audience might know. This, this just, it was meant to be. I was kind of daydreaming at my, uh, I live just a few miles from here in Noe Valley, 
And I was just kind of daydreaming and thinking about what I might do next. And my eyes settled on a book that had been sitting on my bookshelf for a number of years, uh, a terrific book called Saving Monticello that was written by Mark Leibson, who you saw in, in the film. Mark and I had worked together as journalists in Washington, D.C. in the 80s. Uh, and um, I, I have to confess that even though I had a copy of his book sitting on my bookshelf, I had never exactly read it cover to cover. Um, I knew that it was vaguely about this Jewish family that had something to do with, with uh, Monticello. So I pulled it down. I, I was reminded of the story. So I thought, okay, well, here's an interesting story. But I also knew, as I did with my first two films, that I also had an opportunity here to tell a broader story, uh, to use this terrific little-known story of this Jewish family and their long history with Monticello as, as an opportunity to, 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 to tell a broader story. And that story, of course, is this long history of, of anti-Semitism that runs, as you saw in the film, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the course of American history uh, that this one particular family uh, had experienced going back, you know, centuries. And of course, at the same time, in choosing to make a film about Monticello, I also knew that you cannot tell a story that has anything whatsoever to do with Monticello, whether it's Thomas Jefferson as the owner or whether it's uh, the Levy family, without also fully addressing uh, the, 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 the history and the legacy of slavery and, and racism. And so it all sort of came together uh, in this film, and, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's quite a story. Thank you. Um, Mark, central to this film are questions of which stories we tell, and how do these stories inform our broader sense of both American history and Jewish American inclusion and identity. What do the contradictions in this film reveal about the constructive narrative that the United States proved exceptional for Jewish Americans? Wow, thank you. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> so first I just want to say I'd love to get a copy of my book on your bookshelf for the next few years, that would be great. Um, so there's history and that's what happened. And then there's historical narrative. Um, which is what we say is constructed or invented. Which means that all of us, whatever our personal family histories are, create, invent our sense of the past. And let's just say it's all true. All of the facts are there in the history. Uh, and we kind of make it up. And, and we rally around it. Uh, and what I loved about this film is it used a building, Monticello, as a lens through which to see multiple constructions of historical memory. Uh, there's white Jewish stories, there's stories of African, African Americans enslaved, there's stories of, of sort of old white Protestant, there's anti-Semitism in there, and, 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 and through, that, through that building uh, we can see it all. Uh, and we see the conflicts that emerge, because I think what our filmmaker showed um, and I'll just take now a white Jewish historical perspective because that's what I write on. It's really complicated to be white and Jewish in America with the sense that this is a place that has given us privilege um, more than perhaps any other place in all of Jewish history at the same time that we have in Charlottesville that unite the right. And I thought that the film just kept bouncing back. You know, good for the Jews, bad for the Jews, good for the Jews, bad for the Jews. Uh, anthropologists call this liminality. What is it to be part of multiple social groups simultaneously while being a part of none of them completely? And I think we're all just trying to wrestle with, with what that means. Thank you. Marjolaine. How does the Levy's veneration of Jefferson contrast, um, or you know, due to his history and legacy of supporting religious freedom, contrast with his legacy when it comes to slavery and the rhetorical and legal structures of anti-black racism in America? Well, I think a lot of the issue of slavery gets kind of put into the corner of the mind when you are looking at American history because it's difficult for a lot of people to reckon with the fact that so much of our early history was just so terrible with respect to how people from Africa were treated 
and even as they became uh, Americans, uh, were still deprived of being treated as, as Americans. And so you can venerate these people, our founders, but a lot of times you have to compartmentalize how you think about them, and the compartmentalization often buries the things that we really don't want to look at so much. And so you can look at how uh, the Jefferson's uh, contributions to the First Amendment were so important for Jewish Americans. Uh, you know, there's also the fact that, as, uh, as has been said, there's this situation in which, on one hand, you're very privileged to be living in Monticello. Um, at the same time, uh, you have the status of not being the presumed Christian. And at the same time, you're living with African Americans who just don't enter into your um, consciousness, I think, as being the equivalent of you. So there's so many different things going on, and they never really have to be reconciled unless you want to sit down and try to reconcile them, and there's not a lot of incentive to do that. Thank you. Um, Stephen, as a filmmaker, what was your approach to handling these contradictions, and what challenges did you face in reflecting the experiences of the enslaved Africans who built, maintained, and ran Monticello? Um, a, a bit of a confession, my, my first inclination was to kind of uh, live in a state of denial. Um, I, I, when I was first sort of conceding the film, and in fact when, when we were first beginning sort of the editing process, even after some of the production or most of the production had been done, I, I, I found myself in, in, a, in a bit of a defensive crouch when it came to the issue of slavery. Um, I, I, I was vaguely aware uh, that Uriah Levy had, had had enslaved people, but I told myself that um, I was not making a film about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in fact, Thomas Jefferson dies in the first five minutes of the film. Um, and so I kept telling myself that I was not making a film about slavery, I was not making a film about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and. Um, and I began to sort of ruminate about that based on, in part, based on some well-deserved feedback that I was getting uh, uh, when I was t talking about this project with, with friends and, and collaborators. And, um, and, I, 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 and I just came around to uh, fully embracing what I said initially that uh, ultimately I realized that you cannot make a film about a place like Monticello without fully embracing that. Uh, and and, uh, and that's, that's when I went back to the drawing boards and, and knew that uh, I needed some other voices. Uh, Naya Bates, who uh, was instrumental in running the oral history project for many years uh, at Monticello, she then went on to be a, a PhD candidate at Princeton uh, in American history. Uh, she and others really uh, added such a dimension uh, to uh, to this film, uh, and you know it reminds me. Uh, a few months ago, I was showing the film in Philadelphia, and after the film, um, an elderly woman, a Jewish woman, came up to me and said she really liked the film. But then she leaned in and she said, "But." Did you have to talk about slavery so much? <laughs> uh, and it go, her comment goes to what we've been talking about, that this is an element of the story that as a Jewish American filmmaker, it's, and, and as a Jewish, largely a Jewish audience, it's an uncomfortable topic to think of this Jewish family doing this wonderful thing in terms of restoring this iconic piece of American history, and yet at the same time, being part of that slaveholding legacy, it, it was a it was a it was a difficult contradiction, but something that had had to be fully embraced in this film. Thank you, um, Mark. So this film explores a history um, that has a very varied experience between the Jewish and African Americans who are involved in this story. Can you share what lessons you think this might have about the current state 
a rela the relationships between the black and Jewish community in the U.S.? How does this inform where we are today? I actually wanted to answer the second half of your first question that I didn't answer, but I okay. think it's the same answer. Okay, great. So I'm in good shape. Um, what's this story about? What's the film about? It's rhetorical. Um, what's U.S. history? And what's American Jewish history? Uh, and I think, as you were sort of describing sort of very accurately what it's like, especially for white Jewish men, to sort of confront this part, are we going to put it on the margins or footnote it, or are we going to put it into the center, and how um, uncomfortable is that? There's a fundamental sense, I think, at least when I was growing up, you know, and in, in, in going through school and in, in learning about American exceptionalism, that the United States and our history is different and better than any other country in any other place. Uh, and as someone who's Jewish, I was also raised with Jewish exceptionalism, that, um, that America was different and better for Jews, and when it comes specifically now to race, that um, my Jewishness, I'll just personalize it, uh, is um, an antidote to my whiteness. And what we're, so, so I offer as the challenge, you know, to, to what extent is the history of race and racism and slavery not an exception to Jefferson and not an exception even to white American Jewish history? Uh, and to what extent is the exceptionalist idea itself a myth? And when we look then at the beginning of the film in Jefferson's time and then we end the film with the march at Charlottesville and we look at uh, the racial reckoning um, around both anti-Semitism and anti-black racism, we see um, a whole lot of parallels um, from now back to the colonial period that um, I would like to offer all of us in reflection as we leave this film and this day to think about the extent to which that's actually the normative line. And what we perhaps have been raised with and understood in historical memory has been the one that's been invented. Thank you for that answer, um, Marjolaine. One of the most persistent forms of anti-Semitism that the Levy family faced was their consistent erasure um, from the history of Monticello due to the fact that their Jewish heritage conflicted with this white American Christian idea of what it means to be America, uh, American. Um, in our current moment, we're seeing a resurgence of the erasure of history, whether it's the, um, you know, the Florida attacks on, you know, black studies and the AP courses, um, the anti-critical race theory laws and discussions that we're seeing in school boards around the U.S. And I was curious, like, what are the parallels and continuity do you, that you see between this historic erasure that the lobbies faced during their lifetime and the moment that we're in now? Well, we're in such a, a dangerous moment in terms of not allowing people to look at what was true. Uh, so much about what we're taught in schools is what narrative do we choose to present our children? And changing that narrative is very threatening, uh, particularly to people who feel like there's a real replacement theory going on, and uh, somehow their status is threatened. I feel that erasing the, the Levies from Monticello uh, was really something that, you know, the story of Mrs. Littleton, for example, and uh, the idea that America has to be this Anglo triumph over everything else in the world, um, it, doesn't she just seem like a ridiculous, ignorant, hateful person? <laughs> and, and so to look at someone like that, who's able to get this campaign in Congress, uh, does she remind you of anyone in Congress now? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really, um, well, I, I just want to say that um, I learned a lot from this film. And people who can see this film and think there were Jews in the Navy that won the War of 1812 never really you know, occurred to me. But of course, you know, it makes so much sense. If you're coming to a place to be able to live your full self, this, that was the place. 
And it wasn't available for people from Africa. But you know, we're trying to move towards that now. And not looking at our real history seems to be a, a step back and also a step that doesn't have a lot of faith in the American tale of being able to you know, rise above the past and the mistakes. If we can't stand as the United States uh, to look at the things in our past that were wrong and that we're trying to move from, how are we ever going to move from them? You know, we're stronger by knowing the truth. And so I, that's why I begin by saying this is such a dangerous moment, because it's really weakening us to try to hide what we should know about. Can I? I These comments just, just brought one, one little um, episode, actually non-episode as it turned out, talking about some of the inherent contradictions that the film points out. Here is, here is this Jewish family that, that reveres Jefferson for his views on religious liberty, uh, all the while continuing to use uh, enslaved labor uh, in the in the pre-Civil War years at, at Monticello. When I was first starting out on the film, a couple of friends uh, came to me and said, Steve, you got to find out if there were ever any Passover seders uh, at, uh, at Monticello. And uh, I, I made every effort. In fact, Susan Stein, who you see in the film, who's the longtime senior curator at, at Monticello, she's been there for years, and she knows the history of the building inside and out, including during the, during the levy years. She told me that uh, some years ago, she had uh, folks at Monticello going around to the door frames, looking for evidence of nail holes um, and to see if there were ever any mezuzahs uh, at Monticello. She found none. And similarly, the Levy family, it turns out, was ve a very, very assimilated uh, Jewish American family. They were very proud to be Jews, as, as you saw in the film. They go back generations and generations. Uh, but there is a, sort of, for, for, for purposes of losing a little bit of dramatic effect from the film, no evidence whatsoever that there were ever any Passover seders. But, you know, talk about the ultimate irony. Uh, Jews getting together to uh, to tell the story of the passage from slavery to freedom uh, while being served by enslaved people. <laughs> Just can't make it up. Uh, th there is a stage play of exactly that. It was in uh, Mill Valley uh, Theater about five or eight years ago. Uh, that was fictionalized, but it it, it sure it wasn't. Uh, and I, I just like to offer you know a, a challenge on this question, which is. The, the tension between Jefferson on church and state in terms of Jewish support and Jefferson uh, as enslaver, um, to say to what extent is, was that actually seen uh, as a tension? And to what extent would those slaveholding Jewish families in the South who had a Seder uh, and that was prepared and served and cleaned up by African, African Americans in slavery, how much did they internalize this as a problem? And, and I would argue probably less than we would want them to. Uh, and then the deeper question is, what does it mean that uh, these uh, white Jewish Americans were able to internalize what they thought America meant to, to the point that they could love Jefferson on church state and actually not see um, the rest of it? Thank you. So, um, do you remember the Freedom Seder? I do. That you went to, which is an African American and Jewish led Seder. It was a lovely event we went to. This was when I was a, a young, like probably like nine years old kid, and I think it was the first time I ever talked publicly about being black and Jewish um, in the community. So thanks for remembering that, Mom. So I'm gonna... Um, <laughs> you know that's what moms do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna ask one last question for all of you, and then we'll open up to some audience questions. You know, this film draws a through line between um, anti-Semitism, slavery, the birth of the KKK, which had an early founding event at Monticello, um, and our current moment of ascendant white nationalism. And I'm just curious, um, what do you, you know, for, for all of us on, on the stage here, what do you want audiences to take from this history and its relationship to this moment, and how can we work to build solidarity between the targets 
of white nationalists, which include both African and Jewish Americans, given both the contradictions and differences in our experiences and the similarities in how we are targeted? <laughs> you know, I get to dodge questions like that as the filmmaker. I'm on to the next project already. You know? um, but, but no, I mean, as, as we've been talking about here, I mean, obviously the hope is that people see this film, whether they're Jewish audiences or not, and simply grapple with these contradictions that, that, that we've been talking about up here. I mean, it, I, I, I found myself thinking of issues that I hadn't thought of in a long time. Like a lot of, like a lot of Jewish Americans, my Jewish roots in this country go back to that late 19th century um, Eastern European migration. So maybe that's part of my Jewish American exceptionalism. You know, I've got plausible deniability. Um, but but as we've seen in this story, um, there are there were Jews here before uh, Ellis Island, uh, and. Um, and, uh, and, and this, this story of, of, of this one family and their relationship to, to, to Monticello and their adoration of Thomas Jefferson uh, just runs into that brick wall of racism uh, and the treatment of African Americans uh, that went on for you know, three centuries in this, in this country, for two centuries in this country. So those are issues that we continue to grapple with today. Uh, and uh, since making the film, which I always knew was going to culminate in Charlottesville, we just continue to see one horrific event after another. Uh, and uh, those are issues that unfortunately we find ourselves grappling with and uh, never seeming to make a whole lot of forward progress. Yeah, I, I think there's um, a need to understand what we mean when we talk about whiteness now. It's not about skin color as much as about this status of kind of supremacy and believing that you're the norm or that whiteness is the norm. And so that norm includes a lot of things that would exclude both African Americans and people uh, of Jewish heritage. And the attempts to kind of bifurcate or make our struggles against this kind of monolith into really different things is a function of how powerful uh, whiteness can be, you know, as, as a force, the, the force of whiteness. And so, we have to kind of see where that's the common enemy that won't let the fact that you have Jewish heritage or that you have one drop of African uh, heritage uh, exclude you from you know, that, that structure and, and that power. And so the attempts that we've seen lately to um, emphasize divisions between uh, you know, influential or um, you know, popular black figures and, and Jewish people, um, that's just another repetition of the forces that make it impossible or have made it very difficult for us to just see each other as you know, being a people that's trying to get rid of inequality and that's trying to recognize uh, the, the commonality. So, you know, whiteness as a concept is very exclusionary and we need to kind of get rid of that so we can just be people. No more oppression Olympics. And in a strange irony, I think the rise of white nationalism actually is, offers a pathway to, to what you were describing. Uh, I was getting a little nervous when I was previewing the film. 
um, as it was talking about anti-Semitism, and then it was going back to anti-black racism, and then back to anti-Semitism, and some of the, some of the, you know, like, we're, you know, we're talking about the, the, the woman that was trying to, to buy back, and I was like, yeah, she's just a hateful woman, and, and turns out she had power in Congress, and that's how she was able to translate it, but for the most part, like, a lot of the anti-Semitism I was less uh, energized about, and I was more concerned that audiences watching the film are going to now elevate an anti-Semitic threat as opposed to or against ideas about anti-black racism. What we lovingly call the oppression Olympics, who is oppressed more, who's winning the gold medal this week. Uh, and, and it's a terribly divisive and destructive way. Um, sadly and unfortunately, uh, for the white nationalists, um, whether you're black or Jewish or black and Jewish, um, you got the same target on your back. So the notion that different people can look at one another as humans and go into allyship and solidarity, not sort of the 1950s, 60s model of white Jews self-perceiving that they're reaching down to lift up those poor oppressed black people and bring them to, to, to our level. Um, we, we have a moment when white Jews, blacks, black Jews can all um, be together, sadly under the same threat to see that it is actually uh, a sense of commonality and destiny that we all should be working together with. Thanks for all of your responses. We're gonna open up to just a few audience questions as we wrap up. Yes? In the white jacket? You can uh, say it to me and I'll, I'll say it on the mic for everyone here. You think? All right, I think, I, I've seen every single film in this festival and I think every single, the message has been missed, and that is that we are all seeing the disadvantages, but we're not seeing that we each individual human being comes with talents, a history, and, and instead of embracing the opportunities and the the wisdom that we carry genetically and through our families, we're missing the point that we all come with something to contribute and we need the diversity. We need it. She said, uh, do you have a question for our panelists? <laughs> I'm not I want, I want to do the, am I crazy or have I pointed out something of value here? that all of us have value. And instead of shame and blame, we need to be supportive of each other. We all have value, and instead of shame and blame, we need to be supportive of each other. Okay. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, great, great film. Uh, a couple of quick questions. You, you imply but don't state the source of Kyle Levy's I guess wealth that he could buy this uh, plantation in the first place. So that question. Secondly, I was about to ask you about the assimilation thing, which you addressed. Uh, but I think the film made the interesting point that they became more Jewish as a result of anti-Jewish behavior toward them from the you know, Protestant white community. And the other question is, I'd never heard of the uh, court martial, you know, that you went through. It almost sounds like a, a, an American Dreyfus affair, yeah. and could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, so the gentleman asked a, a couple of questions. One, one is, uh, what was the source of Uriah's relative wealth? Uh, and uh, uh, I can assure you that he did not become a wealthy man by serving in the United States Navy uh, in the 19th century. Um, it turns out that Uriah Levy, um, in his, at a very young age, in his 20s and early 30s, uh, scraped together some savings that he had and was savvy enough to buy a number of rooming houses in a lower part of Manhattan that within 10 years became better known as Greenwich Village. Um, and indeed, even, in the, even as early as the 1830s and 1840s, Greenwich Village, while, while not quite as expensive as it is today, was already becoming quite valuable. So, uh, so by the time of Uriah's death in 1862, he was actually considered one of the wealthiest Jews in all of Manhattan. Um, so it pays to invest in uh, Greenwich Village rooming houses, <laughs> I, I guess. Uh, you asked about the, uh, the, uh, the courts martial. 
Uh, yeah, Uriah, uh, as the film mentions, was court-martialed six different times. Um, virtually all of those were simply because he had the audacity to stand up to somebody who had called him a dirty Jew or, or, or issued some sort of insult. It was, it was really all stemming from uh, this rampant anti-Semitism that he encountered uh, during the course of his 50-year career uh, in, uh, in the Navy. One thing that I ended up not including in the film uh, was uh, Uriah actually fought a duel at one point. Uh, a, a fellow officer came up to him at, a, at an officer's ball in Philadelphia, and the, the story is, is that they, they, they basically almost came to blows. The guy called him a dirty Jew, and words were exchanged. And before they knew it, they were crossing the Delaware River. Uh, fighting duels was not legal in Philadelphia, but it turns out it was legal in New Jersey. <laughs> As we know from Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Uh, and uh, Uriah uh, shot and killed the guy, uh, was brought up on uh, criminal charges of either manslaughter or murder, uh, and was acquitted on grounds of, of self-defense. Uh, and the salmon behind the camera? Yeah, thank you. Um, wonderful film. Um, we all study history, um, but we don't hear about that, which I think was really important. And my question is, where else will this film be shown? Will it be on PBS? Have you gotten any fights about making it more broadcast so that more of us can, or more, and my children, can see this kind of history? Sure. Uh, is there anybody here from PBS? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, like most documentaries, and I know there are some other documentary filmmakers, uh, probably a number of documentary filmmakers in the audience, you know, we find our ways to get our films out there. This film has actually been on the film festival circuit uh, for a while now. It's, it's been playing at film festivals around the country. Um, uh, it's going to continue to do that for a while. Uh, the hope is uh, that it'll show up on some streaming platform at some point, perhaps PBS. Uh, but I, I won't know that for a little while. So in the meantime, uh, it's, it's, it's continuing to play at festivals around the country. But one way or another, these films manage to get out there in the world. So tell your kids to keep looking. Thank you. Um, yes, right in the middle. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm just curious, since you did uh, end the film uh, in 2017, um, what has been the impact on Monticello, if any, of Trump era, which I'm pretty sure was still in. Um, I'm hoping you'll tell me there's nothing to tell. What has been the impact on Monticello from the Trump era? Um, well, um, not, to, not to sound naive, but I mean, the institution of Monticello, it's still owned to this day by the same nonprofit foundation that purchased, purchased it from uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy 100 years ago this, this summer. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you saw in the film, they've done a very nice job in recent years, actually for a number of years now, to uh, much more fully embrace uh, not only the story of the Levy family, but certainly uh, the legacy of slavery at Monticello. Uh, if, 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 if any of you folks have been to Monticello recently, uh, the, the foundation has, has done, a, I think, a wonderful job of telling the full story of Mulberry Row, the main plantation street in, in Monticello. They fully embrace the story of Sally Hemings. They don't run away from that part of the Jefferson legacy as they did for decades. Um, and, and, and to that extent, nothing, nothing at the national political level in terms of whichever administration happens to be in power really has much, if, if any, impact on, on what people see and hear uh, at Monticello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just uh, one point of information, then one question. Um, I, I like, I enjoyed this film, and because of it, I touched on many topics that have contemporary relevance, and I know that Isabel Wilkerson was in San Francisco just this past week, and I think she touches this on in a very incisive way in her book cast which is going to be a movie on Netflix in the not so distant future that a friend of mine is co-starring. But my question is, when I look at this book, which I consider to be a very good balance between looking at the rawness of our past with a patriotic flavor, it, if I imagine my conservative friends look re-watching this, this movie, 
or reading Cass for that matter, they are going to look at it as an attack on America in a very, and call it unpatriotic. So how do we get everyone to watch a balanced movie like this with, which looks at both our flaws and our patriotism, has some pride in our country, and in a collective way that is not divisive. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to my colleagues here. Yeah, I said before, what are people... Uh, so, I think the question is that how do we get films like this in front of people who might potentially find the content of it to be challenging? Unpatriotic. Unpatriotic. Un yeah, un-American yes. or unpatriotic. Yeah. And I was saying that, I, you know, it's very hard to convince people to change their minds, but I think you can appeal to patriotism by saying, isn't this a wonderful country where we can look at what we've done wrong and what we've done right and keep working on trying to make things right. So whoever thinks this is, it, whoever thinks it's terrible to look at the wrong things in our past doesn't have a lot of faith in America. So first I'll give my snarky answer to all the futures based questions that I get. That is, it's tough. Uh, I'm an historian. It's tough enough to predict the past. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say that when you're dealing with folks, whether they're politically conservative or whoever is, to see this film or anything, w w what we're going back to is a different constructed narrative, different definition of patriotism, different definition of U.S. history. Uh, they're going to be triggered uh, by different things. They're going to read different primary sources in different ways. Um, so. Um, I generally don't have those debates because I just go back to the, being the historian, which is a lot more fun. Um, but I would say it's probably less fruitful to debate and argue uh, about your constructed narrative uh, about what these words mean against theirs and probably more fruitful to talk about how it is that they came to create that particular sense, what it is about this film or certain parts of it that, that would be upsetting to them. Uh, and then we can try to get at some, some of the core issues. Thank you. Uh, are there... Any last remarks from either you, Stephen, or our panelists that we want to share before we end? Well, thank JFI for uh, having this panel and including me on it and presenting this film. Um, I've watched it a couple of times now, and I, I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciation to the Film Institute and my colleagues, and, and to say, um, as my, my specialty is Jews, whiteness, power, and privilege, and to look out on a sold-out, uh, you know, theater of people that want to watch a very challenging film and then hear us challenge them more to, to me is, is just heartwarming. So it's great to be here. Thanks. And, and I just love being part of the whole team here. So thank you very much. Thank you all. You've been a wonderful audience. We do need to clear the theater before the next screening, but if we do it quickly, we can get those of you who want to come right back in.